It's the round seven review. I'm Tom, that's Rich, and this is The 100 Club. Join us for a review, hot off the press, of the action from round seven as we approach the final games of the group stage. Evening, Rich. How you doing? I'm good. Strange to think that in less than a week's time, you and I will be at Lords along with Ollie, and we'll probably just have seen uh, the winner of the men's competition crowned, and then earlier that afternoon, the, the women's winners. Just a week to go. That is exciting, and we'll have seen the eliminators the day before. I have actually literally just run up the stairs following the uh, the London Spirit um, Oval Invincibles game, so I actually haven't had really a look at the tables yet. So let's uh, let's dive right into what we have seen over the past four days, shall we? Um, yeah, and- let's have a let's have a look back, and then let's have a look forward as to as to what can happen in the next four days to determine who qualifies for the finals. Yeah, because there is there is quite a bit to digest there. I think let's start with. Um, perhaps one of the most extraordinary games of the tournament so far, which was the Northern Superchargers versus the uh, Manchester Originals men's game. Extraordinary for them actually reaching, that is the Northern Superchargers, reaching a total of 200. Yeah. I um, thought it was at the upper range of what was possible based on some of the stats we did at the beginning of the tournament. Um, the equivalent of a 240 score in T20, which is you know very, very impressive. Uh, aided by some horrific fielding, it has to be said by the originals. Yeah, I mean, there was about, I think, 16 runs carried over the boundary, essentially, by Manchester Originals players at one point or another. I, we talked a bit about the home advantage of the 100, and it was incredible mm. to see at Headingley how the noise of the crowd as those catches went up in the air, um, and then the kind of reaction as the catches were spilled, really seemed to have an impact on the fielders. They just weren't used to it. I know. I, I don't want to call it a Roses match, which traditionally in this, in this country would mean Lancashire versus Yorkshire specifically. But there was an equivalent uh, rivalry. When we spoke to Kate Cross in our chat, you know, she, I think she felt it too. Do you right? Am I right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, everyone knows that in the 14th century, the House of Original <laughs> fought the House of Supercharger for the, for the English throne. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, they end, they ended up getting married, so let's not perhaps not a relevant uh, uh, analysis. But the House of Simpson was the was behind the the win. Indeed, Berry born John Simpson, but very much sort of Middlesex own. Um, Simpson had had a kind of a mixed blast. I think in the T twenty blast, he had one hundred and forty runs in in twelve innings, and he's already got one hundred and forty three in five innings in the uh, in the hundred. So something about this tournament uh, agrees with him, and yeah. And ironically, it's one of his best mates, Steve Finn, who he completely took apart in this game, who ended up going for 50 off his 20 balls. Well, there was that. And there was also uh, Dane Villas at the other end, who uh, has been quite an important member of the Lancashire team over the years, also helping him get there. Yeah. And if you're have having, uh, if you interested in the backstory, Dane Villas, of course, was originally signed by the originals and then had to be given up because he was a, originally going to be a domestic player, but couldn't under bre- post-Brexit rules then got released, then got picked up by the Superchargers as cover for Faf de Plessis and has ended up having a reasonable tournament. Yeah, he's played two games um, and uh, did, did just enough, but ultimately 71 not out from John Simpson did the business and there was frankly no chance for the Originals to get anywhere near that total in the end. And I think it was a 69-run win, but yeah, it, it was never one. And quite crucial when we get into the tables because it gave a massive bump to the Superchargers run rate. Yeah, hold that thought. We will get there towards the end. So the women's game, in that sense, though, um, was also um, a relatively one-sided game. So the uh, the Master Originals won that one by eight wickets, which is perhaps surprising, given they're out of the tournament completely. Indeed. In the early stages of the tournament, when Stephen Mullaney became the first and only player to have to self-isolate during the tournament, we were worried there might be a 100-club curse. But now I'm convinced it's the opposite. It's the 100-club bump. We have yeah. a chat to Kate Cross, and then on the back of that, she goes and bowls the first tenor maiden, including two wickets. Yeah, it was a good bowling performance. Um, at one point, I think the Northern Superchargers have given themselves a decent total to defend. Laura Wolfart um, hitting a 75, um, but ultimately really was you know, proven to be an average pitch, as we discovered in the men's game, sorry, a, a, an average score on what proved to be a very, very generous pitch for the batters shown by the men's game. Yeah, Wolf Art was basically responsible for getting the superchargers up to a decent score, and then the originals chased it down relatively easily, thanks to Lizelle Lee, 
with some good support from Mignon Dupree. At one point, I think I tweeted out that 70% of the runs in the game had been scored by South Africans. And, uh, and on her day, there's at least one of the most self uh, not self-destructive, destructive <laughs> batters in the women's game. Um, and she hasn't quite shown that this tournament, but she really did show it uh, on Wednesday. Yeah, so and, uh, yeah, but that's close enough. And some decent support from the top order as well there. Yeah. Uh, we should also give an honourable mention to uh, Liz Russell, one of the other, from the other side that we interviewed, maybe not getting the 100 club bump before you before you attach too much significance to that. Yeah, but she, she didn't bowl too badly and it was no, always no, going to be uh, always gonna be tricky uh, with, with uh, the Zelda the, the backing so well. Yeah, so let's uh, let's move to Trent Bridge. Hot off the Test match being concluded there, they were hosting uh, the Trent Rockets that were were hosting the Birmingham Phoenix uh, in the women's game. It was the Birmingham Phoenix who had it by three wickets in the end, and they they looked to be a team in form. They do, and um, we know that these rivalries are somewhat artificial, and they've been cooked up that this is the Midlands rivalry. But I think there was something that the Phoenix felt after they'd lost to the Rockets at Edgebaston that. You know, they'd left a bit out there on the field. They hadn't performed to their full potential. I think they were very keen to put that right in this game, which they did through, you know, pretty solid all-round performance and then, you know, very good innings by Aaron Burns to get them home. Aaron Burns, ably supported by Emily Arlott, did, you know, did pretty well in that chase because um, it was a decent total set up by the Trent Rockets. Um, but I think they were just pegged peg back by one of the stars of the tournament for me, which is Kirsty Gordon, who took another three wickets. Yeah, very canny spinner. Um uh, and the Phoenix sort of a bit of a dark horse, you know, they will get into the tables, but they're not out of it yet. And, you know, on their day, they've got so many uh, talented players, you know, they, they, they'll be a good match for anybody. Yeah. And and for the media, I think one of the, the talking points of the game was the uh, the resurgence or the recurrence of the uh, the Brunt versus Shafali Verma show. Uh, I, I think that quite pushed your buttons in a way, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, before I go into it, I mean, what, what did you think? What was your reaction to it? Well... I I think there is a place for passion on a cricket pitch, definitely. I um I I think there is a line to be trod though. So I, I rather than go on with that one, where at least there is some sort of recent history, and actually Shafali Verma had hit sixteen or so, and Bun was getting getting into it. I, I I kind of felt it a little bit more. The one that really annoyed me that day was actually um Siraj uh, <laughs> yeah. giving giving the quiet to uh, Hasib Hamid, um, <laughs> who got him for Golden Duck. Yeah, that was pretty harsh. I mean, this has been sort of a bit of a, a, a subplot all summer. We had the England yeah. Libya series, and then these guys have played each other twice in the hundred. You know, and it's been good cricket, you know, going against mm. each other hard. And I think there was after the Test series, I heard an interview with Brunt, you know, saying that yeah, she always wears her heart on the sleeve on the field, and it's only because she affect, she respects Verma so much that she gets worked up, you know, when she gets her out. I think I, on Thursday. When when it's only one way, when only one player is doing the verbals and the other player is not, and the age difference is so stark, you know, one is a sort of 36-year-old season pro, the other is a, essentially still a child. Literally, literally half her age. Literally half her age and still, still, still under 18 years. And you've been sort of, you know, giving verbals but not getting anything back. I think at some point you do have to calm down a little bit. And I think at that point you just have to be... You've just got them out. It's a big wicket for you. You don't have to send them back to the pavilion of a barrage. Sometimes you just have to be a bit aware of the wider context in which you're operating. I don't think as a sports person, you can just say I was lost in the moment. So for me, I agree with you. It's a fine line. I just think Catherine Brunt went a bit too far there. Fair enough. But, you know, as you, I think, also tweeted at some point this week, you know, these are made up teams in, in lots of ways. But actually what there is behind them is real people and real passion about their sport. And, you know, we'll, we'll no doubt have this conversation again about some other occurrences that we see. Yeah. And on the positive side of that, you saw Erin uh, Burns in a post-match interview, you know, the delight on her face that she, she'd taken her team home in a, in a tough run chase. You know, it was mm. so evident. It was great to see. Yeah, and uh, some great fielding. Talk about the 100 Club bump, if you want to keep going with that one, from Katie Mack. Yeah, direct hit from the boundary to run out Nat Siver. Yeah, Game-changing you're moment. You, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Katie. Uh, on the men's side, um, the Birmingham Phoenix ended up with a double double victory as well, actually winning by 16 runs, uh, thanks to another great innings. Uh, I think his third 50 of the tournament so far, Liam Livingston. Yeah, but you know, it wasn't just Livingston, he was widely he supported, you know, Smead was all right again. You know, Miles mm. Hammond had a lovely cameo. And that's the thing I really love about this Phoenix team. They're just fun. 
you know, they bring these guys, these young guys in who sort of seem mm -hmm. to have nothing to lose, uh, even as they sort of chop and change their team when, you know, it was a big loss, Moeen going to the test side, but it didn't really seem to phase them. And Livingston captained them in the same way that Moeen's been doing. Very positive cricket. Guys go out and express themselves. And they put on a huge score. Even with Trent Bridge, it, it seemed a lot. And uh, you know, the Rockets gave a decent, decent fist of it. Steve, Steve Mullaney played particularly well with his 49 off 32 balls. But in the end, he didn't really have much support from the lower order and, and wasn't able to, uh, to to get them close. No, and I, I want to give a, sh a shout out to Pat Brown, actually, the Worcester bowler, who we haven't seen a huge amount of in the tournament to date. Um, you know, a big name coming onto the scene last year's mostly and, and, and carrying into the 100 maybe with a bit more pressure on them than he might have expected. They actually bowled really well, took, took some crucial wickets. They just kept that Trent Rockets team down. Yeah, we're not exclusively talking about players we've interviewed, but I thought when I looked at the team sheets, the fact that Adam Milne was missing was a big loss for the Phoenix. But Pat Brown really stepped up and fulfilled that role of strike bowler in the game. He did barely bowled anything other than a slower ball in his in his sets but uh absolutely effective and really did the job i think so kudos to him um and it was a very very canny performance by benny howe with the ball as well I yeah think. absolutely yeah so those two i think probably did most of the work <laughs> despite <laughs> despite the finesse applied by the birmingham phoenix batting lineup indeed um reluctantly we should talk about the southern brave welsh fire doubleheader as well yeah i say reluctantly because you know I am still a Welsh Fire uh, supporter. I'm debating whether I should take my shirt to the Overland Lords next week. Absolutely, yeah. When when they get those uh, three you know star Australians next summer, they'll be dominating the women's tournament. Yeah, uh, that, and you, you, a bit of Kyron uh, Pollard. Yeah, exactly. It's it's been a tricky tournament this time this time round because of all the people dropping in and out, and I think the Fire have felt that more than most. Yeah. But uh, you know, you absolutely should. And uh, they hit a bang in form men's team in the Southern Brave. Uh, Quinton de Kock winning the man of the match for the second week in the row, or second round in a row, but ably assisted by James Vince as they won by eight wickets. I thought Vince was just so classy in this one. Um, I know Quinton de Kock got, you know, hero of the match, but for me, when Vince was batting, they were just absolutely in cruise control. He just seems to me that 100 that he scored for England um, against Pakistan just seems to have done the world world for his his confidence. You know, it, it sort of seems to have, you know, put something aside that he'd he, he had that international 100. And now he's just kind of, you know, he seems to just have this spring in his step. He's captaining the side really well. He obviously has a good relationship with Jaya Wardner, obviously enjoying his cricket. You can see that, you know, from the fact that he was, you know, wearing his, wearing his hat the other day that his teammates have doctored, you know, <laughs> and all the rest. Um, and I, I just want to throw it out there that, you know, Best has gone back into the test side, you know, after doing well in the 100. You know, Moeen played quite well at Lords today as well. I, mean, um, I wonder if we see James Vince before the end of the summer back in back in whites for England. I wouldn't touch him with a barge pole. No chance for me. Keep him <laughs> away from my England team. There you go. Fair enough. Um, I'd rather have Tom Banton there, but, you know, he took... <laughs> <laughs> he's been taking all sorts of abuse this week, hasn't he? Yeah, this was a very interesting thing that threw up, and we can talk about the general standard of the commentary uh, at the hundred, which some of which has been very good, and some of which has been a bit ropey. And it was a bit P Peter sent it to camera after the game, where he's mm. basically criticising Tom Banton for being going aerial too early in his innings, almost getting to the point of talk, calling him irresponsible, wasting his talent, and all the rest. And you know, I think quite a lot of people in the cricketing world took umbrage at this because one, um, Banton had scored thirty six off twenty in this game got his side off to a great start top scorer of the innings exactly and the kind of players that uh Peterson was comparing him to you know you know Coley Coley, Coley uh, etc Steve yeah, Smith then, then, yeah they don't play the same role in the side if, if Gary mm. Kirsten's coming out and saying I want Banton to you know anchor the innings and bat through 60 balls for 80 runs that's one thing but if Gary Kirsten's sending him out there to get the team off to a flyer and to you know bring all his shots out make the most of the power play then I don't think these aging old pros should be uh, should be criticising. Yeah, and I think this is a wider point here. Is that actually I think we've seen fewer teams employ the pinch hitting or big hitter at the top of their order throughout the tournament than maybe we expected. Yeah, it seems seems to be be that way. That this idea that actually similar to T Twenty cricket, where you want to be one or two wickets down after say ten overs, seems to be the hundred. You kind of you want to get to sort of the sixty ball mark. 
you know, needing two, two or three wickets down and then then explode from there. That seems to be the, uh, the strategy of many teams. Plenty in the hutch. Absolutely. I one other one other thing I wanted to talk to you about that match and and the Welsh Fire again. If you look, indulge me slightly, is somehow yeah, the uh, the hundred stats, which I think are powered by um, by Winviz and Quick Quick Info, is it? Um, uh, have Kais uh, Kais Ahmed as the MVP for all of the men's <laughs> players so far. Any idea why that is? Um, I guess they're factoring in his impact with the ball relative to you know other players. Is he? Is he the linchpin of that bowling attack? You talked before about how you you, you don't think they're quite up to it. Crick right. um, Viz moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> That's all I yeah. can say on that one. I can't see it myself, but you know he's done all right. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think he's the MVP of all male players we've seen in the tournament so far. Anyway, I should move on. Let's talk about the women's game. Um, the Southern Brave came up. Uh, came out on top of that one again probably not surprisingly winning by 39 runs with frankly Wyatt, Mandana and uh, Dunkley doing a, an absolute number on, on the bowlers Yeah and at one point it looked like it could, could even be worse with that mm. opening partnership by, by Wyatt and Mandana. Um, I would say one issue for the Southern Brave is that Mandana has gone back to India now, uh, she decided to take a break between you know the touring schedules and so she did that with the full blessing of, of the team and Charlotte Edwards. Uh, uh, joined Harman by uh, yeah, Harman Preet as well. Yes. Yeah, who I think I think was carrying an injury as well. And obviously with the originals out of the tournament, she decided to cut cut short her 100. I, I think, think that, that is a, in it, with a view to uh, playing a test match against Australia, isn't it, in the autumn or winter? Yeah, that's right. So I think yeah. it's um, that makes sense. I think in Mundana's case, she wasn't injured. She just wanted a bit of time out. And I think that um, it could be... They've got so much batting talent, but it could be a bit of a bit of a loss to them because she's such a good player. I mean, it, it, losing a player that good would be a loss to any team. Yeah, so I mean, maybe a, they, chink, maybe a chink in the armor for the final. Maybe, but I think Sophia Dunkley is just coming into beautiful form at the moment. I mean, yes, Mandana has been great, but they managed 166 there. Um, I think they'll still be an incredibly tough prospect to beat on the day. The advantage of her going now is that they have one more group game so they can give somebody else a go at the top of the order to uh, yep. sort of, you know, as, as a preview before the final. And let's let's round it up then with the uh, the games that have finished within the last half hour. That's the London Spirit Oval Invincibles games at the Oval. Let's do with the women's games first. Um, and the Oval Invincibles, again, looking good, won by eight wickets. A very strange game, this one. So the Spirit, mm. I think, were 80 off 60 with uh, Tammy Beaumont going well. Uh, she got out and then they conspired to use up the last 40 balls to only score 24 runs and lose another eight wickets uh, or whatever it was. So only only scoring 104 when it looked like they were well on for kind of 120, 130. So it was never going to be enough. And I think the uh, the Invincibles really just, just knocked it off. It's worth talking about the dismissal of Tammy Beaumont, of course, which was a tremendous bit of fielding from Joe Gardner uh, with a direct hit from the outfield again. Yeah. It just goes to show, doesn't it, that in modern running, you always say take on the fielder, you know, put pressure on the fielding team. And if there are direct hits from the outfield, then you're always going to struggle. But I think you, I guess you play the percentages because it is rare to get a direct hit from the outfield. But yeah, if you, when you, that happens, yeah, it, run outs really do change matches. Yeah. And as you say, a very modest total for them to chase down. But George Adams getting a 37 not out, doing, doing the majority of the work there, looking great at it. Um, again, yeah, a great crowd. Yeah, Sorry, she's quietly. I was just going to say she's quietly come into it. You know, she had a you know poor opening run, but the last few games she's she's played quite well. You know, want to watch out? Yeah, and and watched again by a bumper crowd today. Uh, Eleven and a half thousand at the halfway point of that game. So good turnout. Yeah, fantastic. You know, busy day of cricket in in, in London. Um, first game of the football season as well. So you know, plenty yep. of sport for people to watch. But Lords was full and, and the Oval was full in the evening. So great that, cricket. That, that's my point exactly. Today is quite an interesting day in the English sporting calendar. You know, Premier League back on full attendances, Lords going, you know, all sorts of cricket and all sorts of sport out there, and and, and they were still getting them through the gate for the women's game. Yeah, um, and and certainly there for the evening game, which had a cracking atmosphere. Um, they were dragging out all the celebrities <laughs> on the BBC coverage this afternoon, from b-list celebrities down to about e um but, <laughs> but the london spirit again showed something of their recent form against master originals where they picked up their first win the season owen morgan did all right starting to look like england's white ball captain but ultimately absolutely undone 
by a beautiful pair of batting performances from some youngsters. Yeah, Laurie Evans and Will Jacks did the business. Uh, yeah. Spirit posted what one forty six and looked to be yeah. well in the game with uh, with three early wickets. But uh, you know, Evans and Jacks built that big partnership, scoring at nearly two hundred for for most of his innings. Laurie Evans had a bit of a yeah. wobble towards the end, but uh, ultimately they got managed to get themselves so so far ahead of the rate that they were able to take it home. Yeah, eight down at the end. I was hoping that um, I could make a pun because on in, in on BBC normally a Saturday night is dominated by a light <laughs> entertainment show quiz show called The Wheel, and I was hoping that the BBC's <laughs> light entertainment this evening would be provided by Brad the Wheel, um, but he only picked up the two wickets. Again, a decent performance though from the youngster. It did. Uh, there was a moment when I think it came to the final ten, and I think Oval needed thirteen, uh, um, but then. Um, Cullen, Blake Cullen overstepped. It's a no ball. Plus, yep. it was a two off the delivery. So that's four. And then from then on, it was always going to uh, be the Ovals game. But, you know, I, I guess the spirit can be the, the positives for the spirits. They brought in some youngsters. They were competitive. Um, you know, things to look out for for next year. I think they'll be a better side. Yeah. Um, yeah. What didn't look as terrible as I've accused them of being in the past. Okay. Shall we look at some tables? Yeah, let's talk it through this final week because there okay. is a lot to play for and it's very exciting. So there's the Women's League as it stands. Uh, seven games played, one left. So maybe it's easiest if we go through it in order and say what the teams mm. need to do. Yep. So the, let's start with the, the Brave are in. They are in the final, regardless of what happens. The Invincibles will qualify with a win and they are more likely than not to get into the finals even with a defeat in their final game against the Southern Brave because they have the best net run rate. So they basically... But a smashing by the Southern Brave could make it interesting, right? That's right. So if they got smashed by the Brave, then that would make it dangerous because then both the Superchargers and the Rockets could potentially overtake them. The Superchargers play on Tuesday against Birmingham and the Rockets play tomorrow against Manchester. So if the Rockets win big tomorrow against Manchester, that would put them on nine points and put them you know with a reasonable chance but then the superchargers already have the better run rate so if the superchargers win as well you would expect it to be the invincibles and the superchargers the phoenix need both the rockets to lose tomorrow night and then they need the superchargers to lose to uh well they can then beat the phoenix and then they don't have to worry about what happens with the spirit and the fire the okay. spirit can just about make it in the spirit if the spirit win and the phoenix beat the superchargers and the invincibles beat the rockets but the spirit beat the fire by much more than the uh phoenix beat the uh <laughs> are you with me still than the superchargers yeah, keep going then the spirit could make it in but that's quite an unlikely scenario okay i'm gonna make it more realistic here oval invincibles and trent rockets are cheering manchester originals loudly yeah. Uh, but ultimately it's probably brave invincibles plus one of superchargers or rockets I think so. I think if, if the Rockets lose tomorrow night, then it means the Superchargers Phoenix is a quarterfinal. Yeah. It's a straight knockout game. Win yeah. it goes in. More or okay. Less. Good. All right. Happy with them. Uh, let's have a look at the men's table. Men's table. Where do we start with this one? So <laughs> <laughs> I think probably easiest to say uh, again that the first game is you know, Rockets versus the Originals. The Originals are, are out. out, they can't make it. Uh, the Rockets qualify with a win. The Brave versus the Invincibles. The Brave can still make it in without a with with a loss if the Rockets have lost. Um, but if otherwise, you know, the winner winners of that, and that, that that's true for the Invincibles as well. So that's not a knockout game as such because they're so Brave no... Invincibles is not a knockout game. Well, actually, because it's reliant on the Superchargers against the okay. Phoenix. Because they play before, so assuming that the, let's assume the Rockets lose tomorrow night, then Invincibles Brave, the winner is definitely in, but yep. the loser could be in depending on the Phoenix Superchargers. However, the Superchargers, if they win and the Rockets have lost, are likely to get in because their net run rate is so good. They'll end up at nine points and they'll probably be better than the Invincibles or Brave. So that's the game to watch, the Superchargers. In both the, in both the women's and the men's game, the Superchargers Absolutely. hold the key to both of these tournaments. Yes, that's the key one. 
that's wow. the, that, okay. that will be that will be the exciting one to go for because actually that, even if, that's even the if Monday the, games, yes, yes. So even if the uh, but but then if the Rockets win, and uh, then it's it's no longer interesting because at that point, um, one of the Vinsmalls or Brave will will collect the points because then you'd have the Rockets and on ten, Phoenix on ten, and, and you know Invincibles or Brave on on eleven. So what you really want is the Rockets to lose to set that other game up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't looked at the weather forecast. That inevitably is going to have its say as well in some sense. I think it's pretty much set fair. I don't think the weather's going to be a big issue next week. Okay. So the, so maybe the most interesting thing about the men's tournament then is who's going to go straight into the final. You've got to fancy the Birmingham Phoenix, given their form. Yeah, Phoenix winning in. Otherwise, it's going to be that Invincibles Brave game to decide it. But the Invincibles okay. Brave game will happen the, the day before. So, you know, okay. we're... we're, we're Look, I think those are the two ones to focus on. Well, actually, it's those three, and then we don't have to worry about you know the fire and spirit. That's just for uh, for bragging rights. Yeah, but uh, I'll tell you no, what I'd those, like to say. Those three that, days um, are going to be fascinating. What I'd like to say is that yourself, myself, and Ollie support the worst three tournament teams in the tournament. <laughs> uh, well done, us, and that pretty much reflects our fantasy uh, team efforts so far. Well, that's well. unfair on Ollie as a Superchargers fan. They're not doing too. Oh bad. gosh, no, yeah, shout. you're right. I'm calling him a Lancastrian. Gosh, don't tell him. <laughs> we'll see if he watches these videos now. Um, <laughs> Rich, it's been another good round, though. So what we can say is actually there's five teams in both of those competitions, at least realistically five teams in both of those competitions. You've got everything to play for. So all of the games count, right? Yeah, with the exception of that last men's game, um, you know, Spirit and Fire, which won't, definitely won't count for anything. All of the games could potentially count for something. And in reality, probably the women's game, Spirit and Fire unlikely but there is a, there is a circumstance where it could, okay. could could come for something in which case that would be very exciting if the spirit needed a massive win in order to uh how would you go about doing that you probably you know try and you know bowl first keep them to a very low total and then yeah chase i'd it get down in 50 balls i'd get shane Warne in a wig <laughs> <laughs> no i'm sure they've got plenty of talent in there to do it on their own effects and i'm sure they're plotting that very plan themselves right now um it's going to be an exciting week we've i think you know we've got that last round of games to go um i will be catching you in person uh come uh, friday for the oval invincibles uh, sorry the oval uh, eliminator games um what else are you going to keep an eye out for this week uh i'm gonna be watching the test match for the next two days <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's nicely balanced as well so um again um if anyone's trying to get a hold of me i'm sorry i'm busy i'm watching <laughs> cricket on multiple screens once again um, i hope you are too and i hope you're enjoying it uh, if you've got any comments stick them down below we'd love to hear from you stick us a like we'd appreciate that and uh, give us a subscribe if you haven't done so already yeah let us know who you think's gonna win i'd love to hear yeah it. Uh, I'm fairly certain we've been bad at predicting all along, but you know, maybe we'll get it right now. Uh, this is the 100 Cup. Thanks for joining us.